everyone and uh, welcome back to the next plenary here at Pidapalooza and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Catherine Skinner who's the Executive Director of Educopia. Um, you probably have noticed that the plenary speakers we have this year are not necessarily kind of PID people in the in the conventional sense of the word, they're people who work um, with PIDs and in and around um, our, our sort of community, but who are also representative of the much broader research ecosystem that we're all supporting. Um, so I'm really thrilled to introduce Catherine. I got to know her a bit with some work that she did very kindly for us with the C4 DISC initiative. So I know that we are going to be in for a really wonderful, thoughtful presentation. Um, so I will hand over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you know, thank you to the program committee for inviting me to speak. Um, and then especially to you, Alice, that was really kind of you <laughs> in that introduction. Um, I also want to share that when I was preparing this talk, I was stopped in my tracks more than once by just the irony of this particular presentation, because I'm giving a talk now on kind of identity politics and trust to an audience that I can't see. I can't interact with, I can't gauge reactions from, and can't actually check in with during the presentation. Um, and then that is doubly mediated at this point. I can't even see the Comcast uh, screen because of the way that my, uh, my own screen is working. And so until the slides are done, I won't have the ability even to see uh, that screen at this point. So lots of irony there, given the topic, and I'm taking a few necessary leaps of faith accordingly, including hoping that what I have to say over the next 15 to 20 minutes is going to resonate and provoke, and hopefully provide you all with a few things to think about and watch for in the future. So I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with the work of the organization that I have the honor of directing, which is the Educopia Institute. And our shared mission, as is uh, stated in the, the center of the slide here, is uh, to empower com collaborative communities to create, share, and preserve knowledge. And in all of our work, we are encouraging knowledge sharing and network building across institutions, across communities, and across sectors. And all of the Educopia founders actually directed successful grant funded uh, collaborations in the past. So we were founded around 2006 and all of our founders uh, had witnessed firsthand what we often refer to as the valley of death that stretches out in front of great projects once the grant funding ends. Um, and here are just a couple of representations of the way that especially the medical community looks at that. Um, we knew that most project directors and also most community directors, because I recognize not everything starts off of grant funding, of course, um, through no fault of their own, they, they often don't have, they, they simply are not equipped with the knowledge, the expertise, et cetera, for navigating the creation of a business, a sustainable business. And so, so often the organization building skills and even the community engagement building skills um, just aren't there to, to successfully navigate that space between the starting point and uh, the longevity that they may imagine or hope for. And so it was in that valley that the founders of Educopia saw a place where they really could help and a opportunity really to provide the administrative and organizational scaffolding that community networks often need and again, often lack. Um, and the focus point of our work has always been libraries, archives, museums, publishers. Uh, we generally refer to that whole space now and that whole spectrum of players um, as knowledge and information providers um, so and creators for that matter as well. And so from 2006 forward, what we've hoped is that through our work, this valley might be a little less vast um, and that it would become a lot less deadly for some of the stronger programs uh, that, that really did need the long time uh, survival. So to support that, what Educopia does is we have developed and we've provided services and training opportunities for uh, collaborative efforts of all types. So we use a pretty broad definition for community. Uh, you see the community cultivation field guide here on the, the slide. And it's an example of the kind of work that we try to do and that we try to give away open access, um, open source wherever we can, because what we're trying to do is really help communities and businesses make the transitions happen between that kind of early stage formation, 
through some of the uh, the initial problems of validation and kind of garnering support, and then all the way to acceleration and uh, sometimes even sunsetting and you know other kind of end of life uh, work. And our focus, as I mentioned, is on the knowledge industry. And from the start, this has not been something that we really offer to communities. It's something that we embed within them. So our intention and our ethos is always to empower the leaders of any program or business. And sometimes these are 501c3s, sometimes they're for profits, sometimes they're non-incorporated entities. Um, but whatever the movement or program or business is, we try to give them the tools and the skills that they need in order to do the work of community engagement and um, really you know, community-led operation, operationalization. And we want them to have the best possible chance of staying power. And that means that dependence on Educopia is never the goal. We really want to teach them to fish, not just uh, you know, fish for them. And our premise has always been that with modest resources that are geared towards facilitation, communities can be fostered and encouraged to thrive and that thriving communities actually have a ripple effect and can make big changes in the whole ecosystem. So with that said, um, we host several affiliated communities and you'll see them at the middle of this slide. Uh, the Meta Archive Cooperative, which works with roughly 100 institutions across three uh, continents on digital preservation and actually provides the um, embedded network capability back at those local institutions so that, again, you know, we're, we're teaching to fish, we're not fishing for. Um, the Curator Consortium, which is another membership organization that uh, works on born digital archiving. Library Publishing Coalition, uh, which has been around since about 2013, and we helped to found each of these companies or these uh, groups. Library Publishing Coalition is the one that intersects the most, maybe, with uh, with all of you, and at this point is a thriving community that we you know love to work with. And then the Software Preservation Network, which is our newest community, it's just now launching as a formal community. Um, with each of these affiliated communities, part of what we're trying to do is, is study and uh, build capacity for the kinds of um, empowerment and scaffolding and administrative and technical infrastructures that so many organizational forms need. And we complement that through a whole bunch of research that we do as well. And so what's important about all of this work in the context of my talk today, and the reason that I'm spending the first uh, couple of minutes on this in particular, is that we get exposure at Educopia to all kinds of organizational and governance models. I am a sociologist by training. Uh, my research continues to focus on the intersections that are there between sociology of business on the one hand and sociology of culture on the other. And since 2006, I've had the pleasure of really studying community formation and development in action in all of our consulting clients, in many of our research projects, and then certainly in these four uh, affiliated communities that nest within Educopia. And we get to put all kinds of different lenses on this. So, you know, social movement theory, I draw on a lot. Um, sociology, certainly, I draw on a lot. Organizational psychology, um, economics, business. You know, all of these different spaces give us insights into what allows communities to thrive. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is understand and improve the health and the alignment of communities, particularly those that are involved in this knowledge production space. So with that said, in our research, we have consistently found that the single most important element in collaboration and community-driven work is trust. So trust is also one of the hardest elements to secure. It's one of the hardest to keep up over time because of the variety of players that you're engaging with um, and because you are working with an ecosystem. And I'm actually gonna go back to the slide. I like this one better for this. Um, trust always involves risk. So when one entity chooses to trust another, it is a choice and there are expectations and responsibilities that are invoked in that, whether those are invoked consciously or whether that happens unconsciously. And if those expectations and responsibilities aren't met and fulfilled, then, or, or actually even if they are just perceived as not being met and fulfilled, and that perception piece is big here, then trust is broken and it turns into distrust. 
So when trust between entities is high, cooperation and work towards shared goals become much more possible. And PIDs, of course, are, uh, or PIDs, are a key example of this. When we can trust each other to actually create and maintain and describe and use the PIDs in the same way, the systems of practice can and will build upon these PIDs. And we've seen this, you know, both in the print uh, domain, certainly, and, and now in the digital domain, and many of you have made that possible. But the tower of faith that that implies is not unlike the tower of humans here in this uh, image of Castelliers in Barcelona. It'll crumple if even a few of the engaged people that are depicted here or a few of those in that stack um, lose their focus or if they step away. So with PIDs functioning as a crucial hinge in our scholarly communication infrastructure, they, they are enabling all of these ways of connecting people, places, objects, objects of all kinds um, in network digital space. The big question becomes what level of trust do we and really should we have in the PID providers and the hosts, meaning the organizational infrastructures and communities upon whom scholarly communication increasingly depends? And then how can we strengthen that trust? So <laughs> trust in the scholarly communication industry, it's fraught at best. Um, the roots of distrust run really deep and wide between academic players and there, I would say most particularly the publishers and librarians, but also a growing number of scholars and editors that that group continues to grow um, both in the sciences and across the humanities and social sciences. And then many of the for-profit and external service providers that own and control so much of the infrastructure that supports our scholarly research and publishing area, um, along with a giant swath of the Academy's research outputs. So, you know, there's, there's control on both sides. Um, academic publishing, when we think back to the 1970s and before, it was really a cottage industry. It had low to no profits. Um, it, it now numbers among the world's most lucrative industries. Um, information and knowledge is packaged all the time as a luxury commodity and its dissemination is both carefully guarded and highly monetized. And I really could talk about this phenomenon for hours. Those of you who know me know that I do so on a regular basis, um, including all of the details about how consolidation began, where it's still leading today. But given the time um, and the fact that I've only got about five more minutes to talk to you before I want to be able to welcome you to talk to me, um, I'll say that as large industry players, dominance over this industry continues to expand through consolidation and acquisition practices. Academic players continue to recognize that they've lost control over their own academic outputs in many cases and, and how those outputs are disseminated, how they're measured, and now how they're analyzed and ultimately used. Um, and this is creating a sense of broken trust. Um, I think that the trust has been broken most destructively, at least maybe, um, and from my admittedly, you know, my perspective and my point of view as both a scholar and someone who works closely with libraries and publishers, uh, especially the academic publishers. Um, when community-led enterprises that seem to be aligned with and serving academic mission become acquired by dominant industry players, trust is broken. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the, the shaking of faith that happens every time one of these acquisitions happens within the field, it continues to send shockwaves throughout the academic sector. And folks say, again, <laughs> as, though, as though it's a surprise, like really, again. Um, restoring trust in an ecosystem where interests are muddled and where dependencies are high is going to require that we negotiate and that we articulate very clear expectations and responsibilities that don't put us in a binary. So the danger right now and part of what I see happening, and this is not new, this has been happening for a long time, but I think in the increasingly competitive environment, um, it's it's growing in in the in its amplification. There's a binary. There's the for-profit players and there's the academic players. As though, and I'm I'm even falling into some of those languages, and I own it. Um, it's not a binary. We are all part of this ecosystem, but there are a lot of layers of broken trust that we're trying to mend right now. 
And for years, people have been trying to lay a solid groundwork and frame for us to build some better trust between all of these different players and really to make sure that um, that scholarship and open scholarship and open knowledge becomes a reality, not just something that we wish that we could have accomplished, but something that we really bake into the systems that we support, the, the places that we publish, the groups that we work with, et cetera. Um, one of my favorites uh, is Jeffrey Builder and uh, Jennifer Lynn and Cameron Nalen's Principles for Open Scholarly Infrastructure. Uh, here is the blog post, of course, where, where that uh, piece first came out. And that piece synthesized more than a decade of work, not just by those three players, but by the Force 11 community, by many who were already engaging in this general space. And what they did beautifully is they laid out, you know, governance, sustainability, insurance, and implementation as these concrete spaces where organizations and communities can demonstrate their community alignment and can make sure that they're empowering things in a direction that truly does align with the concept of open scholarship and really um, fostering uh, an advancement of knowledge, uh, not just an advancement of profit. And both nonprofits and for-profits and even academic institutions are all at risk of moving towards profit rather than moving towards the um, open scholarship goals. And so one of the things that gives me great hope right now is watching all of the ways that the principles of open scholarly infrastructure are being built on, because I do think that they provide this bridge that all of us can use, regardless of what kind of business apparatus or community framework we're using. These principles kind of cut between all of those layers, and there are different ways that we can show that we are adhering I love the recent post from Crossref. I loved watching and hearing about the work that went on this past year in not just living it, which they have, of course, um, but starting to find ways to document how they're living the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. But the big problem with approaches like this is that they're one off. So it's fantastic that Cross Crossref and their board um, have now adopted the principles of open scholarly infrastructure in this very specific way. But one of the big questions that I keep asking, and I'm certainly not alone in this, is how do we do that as a field so that it's not one off and it's not each, each organization deciding for itself how it is adhering to a set of agreed upon principles, but instead something larger? Um, there are a lot of things that I could point to, and I'm going to not do so. I'm going to flip through these so that you know what I would do if I had more time. Um, there are a lot of places where we have started exploring from Educopia and in collaboration with lots and lots of partners, um, how to start to document what the organizational infrastructure elements are that are important and that we need to be paying attention to both as communities and then also as those who are buying into those communities. Um, and you know the, the core question for me is, can we define shared values? Have we already done so in a way that we can measure ourselves by them? And can we incentivize and demonstrate adherence to those values and do so in a way that is not so bulky and bureaucratic that A, it gets gamed and B, it takes too many resources and means that it becomes prohibitive for new groups to come in rather than something that really uh, enables all of us to be growing more and more in alignment. Um, we published a report on this recently from Educopia through the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. So I'll nod to that very quickly. Uh, you can find all of these resources that are Educopias on our website. Um, SCOMCAP was just released yesterday, also by the Next Generation Library Publishing Project. Uh, it is a fantastic new resource that is not finished by any stretch of the imagination. It's just a start and it's just a way to start looking at, you know, what are the different technologies that we rely on right now in scholarly communication and how can we start to catalog those effectively. Um, fair sharing, uh, hats off to this group. I could talk about this too for hours. I was so excited when I saw what they are doing right now in terms of taking the fair principles and really making sure that there are standard ways of assessing not just adherence to those fair principles, but also adherence to some of the organizational um, and community-based uh, pieces that undergird those principles. 
And then finally, I'll nod to developing a pilot data trust for open access ebook usage, which is a project that University of North Texas is running. We're a subcontractor on it. Um, and is also looking at, you know, how do we incentivize lots of players from different spaces, the commercial, the non-commercial, um, the academic institutions themselves, how do we bring everybody together around these shared pain points so that we can do more with the knowledge that we have? So I will stop there. I will also stop screen sharing and be able hopefully to engage with you guys for just a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was great. <clears throat> um, and you raised so many uh, very uh, important questions. And I can't see. Hmm. Catherine, I think you might have taken yourself off stage. So I'm going to try and bring you back. <laughs> no, not allowed to go quite yet. <laughs> um, no worries. Uh, I am going to start. Um, that we've got several questions, and I don't think we're going to have time for all of them. I'm afraid. Um, but uh, let's see what we can get to. So, uh, this is a, this is a very nice one. I think to start with. Um, is there a current group you look at and think, yes, you're doing a great job, and why? That's a question from Rachel Lamy of Crossref. And actually, you might have answered great, it great in the question. shout out you I gave to them. I mean, Crossref, Crossref is up there for me right now. Um, and there, there are a lot of different examples of players that are really trying. There are lots of good players, right? But there are also a lot of good players who are really trying to demonstrate what they mean by being good players. Um, and so some others that I'll point to, uh, Ubiquity, which is you know, not explicitly in the PID space, but certainly uses PIDs, um, has embedded some business language in their uh, documentation over the last couple of years that makes clear that they will not be available for purchase. Um, so some of those kinds of moves by groups that really want to be academic driven and you know, want to, to make sure that they've got close community relationships, um, I think are really positive. And then there are a lot of uh, groups like Invest in Open Infrastructure, um, SCOS, there, there are a lot of groups that are trying to study this in different ways and are coming at it from different angles. And part of what I hope is that we can all kind of come together so that we capitalize on the strength of all of our approaches and kind of synthesize those and align those and, and have something that, that lets us all practice what we're preaching. Absolutely. I think, you know, not doing things in silos is, yeah. is the answer, isn't it? Okay. Um, another question. Could you give some examples of the impacts of the broken trust that you mentioned? And that's from Chris Shillam of Orchid. Yeah. So, and I'll, I'll call names because I think it's one of the things that I can do from where I sit. Um, you know, B Press was a giant break of faith with the library publishing community in particular. So Berkeley Electronic Press, you know, certainly was founded within an academic environment. Um, it had already been acquired once before. It shouldn't have been a giant, I mean, it was a for profit. There were all kinds of reasons why it shouldn't have been a giant surprise when B Press was acquired by Elsevier, but it was, and it was a gut punch because for a lot of players in library publishing, B Press was something that they thought that they did own and control. Um, and so I think it's also been a big wake up call. Um, I think that I'm watching, you know, and, and let me be clear, I'm not calling out Elsevier as evil in this space either. Again, commercial and non-commercial both have play, roles to play. There are things that we cannot accomplish without each other. Acquisitions are not bad. They just can be incredibly complicated and they can break trust. And when trust is broken, cooperation becomes hard to accomplish. Um, so the other one that I'll mention is Hindawi and Wiley right now. And I think all of us are watching with bated breath and hoping that that amazing uh, think tank and coding shop and I mean, all the things that it has been um, is maintained in, in ways that are as close as they can be in alignment with academic mission. Yeah. 
Um, so one last question I think we can just squeeze in, which is, uh, can you say anything more about sort of measuring values? Um, that's from Ted Haberman. I think he means probably how to measure values. I hope that's what you mean, Ted. Really hard. <clears throat> and it's one of the things that is left wide open by a lot of the kind of manifestos and, you know, principled statements. And, you know, there are hundreds of these. There's a great list of them from Force 11. There are others that have compiled these as well. Um, and you can also find them compiled in the, the Living Our Values report that I pointed to. Um, the, the, the big, sorry, I just got distracted by the chat. I know. About <laughs> don't look, don't look. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, I just totally lost my train of thought because of that. The values we were talking about, the, how to measure values. How to measure values, sorry. So one of the big problems there is that, you know, how do you say you're community governed? Um, there are markers and there are lots of examples in other fields of how to do that work. So for example, nonprofits a whole set of codes, including standards for excellence in the United States. There's a similar set of informal, but still rigorous uh, measures in the UK and in France that are that are kind of similar to what standards of excellence are in the US context. Um, so there, there are ways to do this. There are even models for how to do it, but we have to actually apply those. And we've started doing that in some beta forms and so have many other groups. Um, but it's a it's an interesting question and definitely one that it'll take us a long time to answer. Great. Well, thank you. I think we're going to have to wrap up there, I'm afraid. But thank you again so, so much, Catherine. This was really uh, just what we need to hear. I think we all know that trust is a huge issue and something that we all believe PIDs can help address. But in order to help address it, PIDs themselves have got to be trustworthy and there's still a lot of work to be done there. So lots to think about. Thank you very much. And uh, I have my own little yeah. tiny hand clap, but I know there's lots of hand clapping going on around the world. And um, so uh, everybody, we're going back to the tracks now, and we have our Spanish language track starting now. It's very exciting. So there's the introduction to PIDs in Spanish, followed by, I think, three additional sessions in Spanish. Uh, we have a session on how to make more publishers come to Pidapalooza uh, using Hindari as a use case, and that's uh, Katrina McCallum and Alessandra Odino. And we have PIDs in the DINI certificate, which is Paul Beerkant, Daniel Bucher, Isabella Meinecke, and Thomas Severian. So thank you all very much. And we will see you back here for the break, I think, is the next thing. And thanks again, Catherine. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Bye.